Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com. This time on Broad and High, we'll explore hidden space of the Ohio State House. This is the exterior of the interior, if that makes any sense. And literature and theater collide on stage. We're really thinking about something that's really intimate and also that's something that's far away, which is also always the condition of reading and of theater. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm Audrey Hassan. Welcome to Broad and High. It's not a dome, it's a cupola. That's the architectural term used for the drum-shaped roof that sits atop the Capitol building. The staircase that reaches up inside it used to be open to the public. It's been closed for years, but we were given a special tour into this space beneath the roof that once offered the best view in town of the Columbus landscape. So Luke, where are we right now? We're in the State House, we're in the Rotunda of the Ohio State House. And what happens in this space? So this is where kind of people flow. We have the elevated Senate chamber, we have the elevated House chamber, and ergonomically this is kind of where people meet. Tell me a little bit about the history of the pink color of the walls here in the Rotunda. So that's a question we, we field a lot. Uh, it's a very manly, manly color. For 1860 America, it comes from red. Red stood for honor and bravery. It was also very expensive to produce. Our recipe called for gold dust. It was a way to kind of show off. It's like, hey, they can afford pink paint. And, you know, this is the people's house and the people's government. Tell me about where we're going. We're going to go up there. So you can see we have an oculus. So again, the dome is Roman, the cupola is Greek, so it's kind of a mixed match of the two uh, architectures. The best way to explain it is a half an egg with a tin can on top. So we're seeing the half of the egg. When we go upstairs, we're going to see the exterior of the interior. So Luke, where are we right now? We're now on the third floor of the Ohio State House. This is the magic door. Okay. You ready? Yep. All right. Let's go. Time to go back in time. So Audrey, we're actually cheating a little bit. Um, since we're on the third floor, the staircase actually begins down in the crypt area. So there's 207 steps all the way to the top. We're going to do about 90. You tired? <laughs> okay, for now. All right, well, one more, one more flight. And like I said, it gets a little bit narrow. Wow, this gets a lot narrower. So this is the lower level of the cupola. Um, again, we were talking about the, the half egg with the tin can. Mm -hmm. This is the exterior of the interior, if that makes any sense. Oh. So we were in the interior, we are now on the exterior around the outside of that dome structure. In the rotunda. In the rotunda, correct. So these are the last 20 steps, and you can see, again, the dip. These are all original to 18, probably 1860. Here we are. So people have made their mark over the years. And they used to carve their names? Yeah. So here we have the oldest signature that I have found so far, J. Cook, 1870. So that's 10 years after the building was officially completed. So from the outside of the State House, what would people be seeing for this space? So this is where we're going to see that, that Greek structure, that, that round temple. So you're going to see 360 degrees all the way around, two banks of windows. Um, so you, again, you have that, that interior dome with the exterior uh, cupola. And at what year was this open to the so public? The, the building itself, we start using it in 1857. This was probably done, open to the public, 1859, 1860, 158 feet tall. So this was actually the tallest building in Columbus, Ohio from 18, say 1859 to 1906. So a huge, massive, expensive building for the time period. Actually, one of the things it was, it was known for uh, honeymooners. Newlyweds would come down here. You know, you grew up in Delaware County. The tallest thing you see is a barn. Come to the big city and, uh, I don't know, maybe 
couple of kids were conceived up here, who knows? So Luke, there's a tragic story from up here, correct? There is, yeah. In 1886, we, this comes from the Columbus Dispatch, O.H. Hall was the clerk of the Ohio House and his niece was up here on the lower level. One of the window panes was out and she actually fell 13 feet, cracked her head, survived the fall, but, but died later, later on, but yeah, you gotta be careful. Well, thanks for showing us oh, this historic you're space. It's awesome. Well, do you, there is one spot if you have some time. Really? Yeah. Let's go. All right, let's go this way. So we're almost, almost there. So we started down in the rotunda. This is the top. Wow. So in through this door is the seal? We'll be able to see the, the oculus of the Ohio State House. Wow. So here we are. Wow. Trip's not complete. I can write? Yeah, please. Although there's restricted access to the cupola these days, there are still plenty of beautiful spaces inside the Ohio State House that are open to the public. Free guided tours are offered daily. Learn more at ohiostatehouse.org. In Virginia Woolf's 1927 novel, To the Lighthouse, there is very little narration and very little action, but there is plenty of observation. The same can be said of last month's experimental stage performance at the Wexner Center, where internationally renowned visual artist Anne Hamilton joined forces with the City Company out of New York. Their goal was to present the theater as a blank page and to transform the role of the audience. City Company has been around for 23 years. We're an ensemble theater company, meaning that the company is run by its members. We create new work, we tour that new work, we encounter young people coming into the field, we are interested in where the theater is going and to find training structures that can actually support that growth of the theater, and we invite young people into the process whenever we can. I'm a visual artist that has worked in response to architecture, architectural space and social context. I've been interested uh, for a long time within the work, not so much in uh, the object or the experience of the object, but the relationship between things James and Ramsey lifetime. James sitting on the floor, cutting out pictures from the illustrated catalog of the Army and Navy stores endowed the picture of a refrigerator, as his mother spoke, with heavenly bliss. It was fringed with joy. The wheelbarrow, the lawnmower, the sound of poplar trees, leaves whitening before rain. I think that Anne and I got together after some show, and she would always come see our shows, and it was a thrill for both of us, and we started plotting a long time ago. It was always something like, oh, we should do something together, or let's do something together. But it was really Chuck Helm well, who made it possible for this, life, uh, this Charles suspicion Tansley to become a reality. felt an extraordinary pride, for he was walking with a beautiful woman. He had hold of her bag. It's a very collaborative process, and it's conversational at every level with everyone on the design team, with the actors, with everyone training from the beginning. We've just been really elbow to elbow trying to find the form for this through our questions and through our hunches and through our mutual but often different responses to what this circumstance is. How did is. he know, she asked, the wind often changed. The extraordinary irrationality of her remark, the folly of women's minds enraged him he had ridden through the valley of death, 
been shattered and shivered, and now she flew in the face of facts, made his children hope what was utterly out of the question, in effect told lies. He would never reach R. He was restored to his pride. He stopped to light his pride. Looked once at his wife and son in the window. It's an almost impossible project, not only for the actors who are not playing traditional characters, for the technical crew who is actually performing in the play, uh, for it's also a. a a challenge for the audience. There's a call to adventure, will they accept the call? And the acceptance is about allowing spaciousness into your life. So the process has been one of faith, the faith that will all come together and that when the audience arrives, the magic will happen. Beauty in the tributes that reached him from Swansea, Cardiff, Exeter, Southampton, Kidderminster, Oxford, Cambridge, why so brave a man in thought should be so timid in life? What she called being in love flooded them. They became part of that unreal but penetrating and exciting universe, which is the world seen through the eyes of love. The bird sang through them. And what was even more exciting, she felt too, as she saw Mr. Ramsey bearing down and retreating, more than gazing at Mrs. Ramsey, was a rapture equivalent Lily felt to the loves of dozens of young men in the absent-minded manner, subduing all her impressions as a woman to something much more general, becoming once more under the power of that vision which he had seen clearly once and must now grope for among hedges and houses and mothers and children. Her picture it was a question she remembered. They could see in the foreground by an object, James perhaps so. But the danger was that by doing that, the unity of the whole might be broken. We've made a book that um, you sign out like a, with a library card when you arrive, and that is the uh, a copy of To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. And so you can actually follow along, and you have the weight of this thing in your hand, and it's printed on newsprint and it it has the quality a little bit of a book and a score and it has a pencil so that you can mark it and that there's something it's like we're really thinking about like what is in your hand and what is in your lap so something that's really intimate and also that's something that's far away and that structures the piece this near far um, relationship which is also always the condition of reading and of theater whereupon the spell was broken did Nancy go with them? Certainly Nancy had gone with them, since Minta Doyle had asked it with her dumb look, holding out her hand as Nancy made off after lunch to her attic to escape the horror of family life. She supposed she must go then. She did not want to. She did not want to be drawn into it all. As they walked along the road to the cliff, Minta kept on taking her hand. Then she would The city of Upper Arlington recently installed three new sculptures outside of the Miller Park Library. They were a gift of sculptor Alfred Tibor, a Bexley resident and Holocaust survivor. The sculptures evoke life, movement and freedom, just like the park space where they now reside. Take a look. I 
came back from Russia, from Siberia. And I found out I don't have my parents, I don't have anybody. 273 people, two of us survived. So one brother survived, Andrew and me. And that's why I made my first statue, a Holocaust memorial. Um, well, at the city, we believe a great community deserves great art. And so we have an arts and community spaces program where we put art in our parks, bringing art out of the gallery into the people. But we, of course, have known Alfred for many years because of his work with Holocaust memorials and education in our schools. Um, and so we started having a relationship with Alfred, and he started talking about these other pieces that he had at his home, and he was looking for a place for them. And lo and behold, after a number of conversations, he decided to put them here in Upper Arlington, and we're thrilled. We have 14 pieces total. We've put three here at Miller Park. We have another four in a spot yet to be determined, but we sort of have an idea. And then we've partnered with Dublin Arts Council to place seven sculptures there. The three pieces we have here are Movement, Free, and Ribbon Dancer. Um, and each of them are bronze sculptures, life-size, uh, that have themes to them that you would see in a park or a library or a community setting, movement, dance, freedom, um, and we, we just think they look really great here. There is no other way I could show a human being. They're so lyrical, I just they're just so beautiful. Um, he has a really wonderful eye for the human form. And considering Alfred and his history, you know, his surviving um, so just man's atrocities to man during World War II, it's amazing to me that he has such a celebration of life, such a love for humanity. Uh, his message now is, you know, hate doesn't work, right? And so he's always celebrating life and our humanity. And I think that you're right, it really comes through in his artwork. I am defying the hatred. I am a survivor. The Third Coast Kings aim to stay true to the roots of deep funk and soul music. The band draws much of its influence from James Brown in both sound and style. Enjoy this segment from our friends up north at Detroit Public Television. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the Third Coast Kings. We love the fact that you are here right now. Get ready to get down, because it's been a long week. And now, we are all here together. Don't get it wrong, don't get it twisted. Friday night, let's get lifted. I know you're all standing around, but by the time we're done, I want to see y'all having some disco fun. I had a few different bands that I had been working on, and um, I guess I sort of realized that there was a certain type of music that I was, I was getting closer to, and it's something that was more meaningful to me and that was funk music. It was, it was more like a subgenre of the deep funk, the deep soul, stuff like that. And uh, I started looking around on the internet and I, I ended up finding a bass player. And uh, my guitar player was Steve, who's actually now the bass player. So we put the band together and it was a few different things. Um, a few different names. We were the Monarchs, we were Styles Davis. So we eventually settled down on, on the Third Coast Kings, which was where we got serious. And uh, we decided that this was going to be the thing that, you know, we would, we would launch to, to the public. Well, I love the feeling of it. I guess, I mean, you could call that the soul of it or the groove or something like that. But I just, I think, um, it makes you feel good, it makes you want to move. What this band is as if 
James Brown during the years 1968 and 1975 had maybe a little bit more jazzy horn sections. The charts are almost a little more slice of bebop and big band jazz um, with a drummer that's playing at a little different tempo than the James Brown songs. My direction was um, some of the old school funk stuff, some of the obscure stuff. It's something that's it's got a lot more power to it, it's got a lot of uh, feeling to it, and it's harder to find. So there were a lot of DJs that were digging up these records, you know, looking for this deep funk sound. And, uh, you know, once I locked into that and started following what they were doing, that's where I discovered our sound. Spice it around. Girl, wanna get you, yeah. A tidal wave of Monet's when you caress my face and my camera love your skin tone so I even love your cell phone. Call me, I will simulate the making of waves cause you're so special. I mean it came from soul music, it came from Motown and at the same time there were so many other bands, the, you know, in the big sea of things there are all these little fish that are trying to compete for the same sound. And uh, the stuff that we try to recreate are those little fish. It's, you know, track eight, side two of an album they own, but they didn't hear it more than the first time. So it's like, oh, wow. And so I, I guess a lot of our songs that we write that are ours, uh, we try to have that, oh, wow, factor. I'm winning so much in this. We're a funk band and we do funk music, you know, we don't dally and a whole lot of other stuff. It's deep funk, you know, and people get it, you know, when they, when they hear us. And honestly, as complicated as my life is sometimes, it's, it's, it's nice to be like, this is what it is. It's one thing that we do. You can focus on that. It's all got to have a foundation. It's like a house for us. It's, um, it always starts with me and my bass player. We come up with some grooves. From there, once we have something that we like, we'll record it and then send it off to the horn players and they write on top of that. I just play the rhythm that I know is, uh, is the right sound, it's the right fit. And then uh, I leave the guys to the rest. You know, we interact, you know, it's all, it's a nice creative process. You know, we'll spend time in the think tank and um, it always works out. You don't see a lot of bands with that many people in them. We've got, you know, guitar, bass, drums, trumpet, trombone, saxophone, two singers, so eight people. I think it's a, it's a simple sound. It's very, you have um, the horns, which have a very specific kind of sound, and then the driving rhythm section. Um, and I think we try to, we really try to make our music as simple as possible and kind of strip down to the style. I think that's where the deep funk comes in, is that it's, it's really supposed to be just about that, that groove at the center of it all. Now imagine! You are in a 1982 Cutlass Supreme. And you are driving down Woodward in Detroit, Michigan. You take a right hand We are influenced by Detroit a lot. Our, our, our upcoming album, um, you know, we've got some song titles on there about Detroit, West Grand Boulevard, Mayors of Detroit. I mean, the, the heritage in Detroit, the music is is huge, you know, so it's very inspiring, you know, in that regard, and there's a lot, there's a lot of good funk. What this song is all about. I think musically, Detroit's got an incredibly deep musical history. So, I mean, for me, it's something that's very special to be a part of it in some way and s somehow try to continue that history that's there. Um, I think we have a huge responsibility to try to represent Detroit in the best way we can. 
In fact, to me, if we say we lived anywhere in Michigan, called ourselves a funk band, and didn't try to play in Detroit, then that's a penalty. That's a personal foul. If you're near Mecca, you go to Mecca. You can go anywhere on this planet and say, we're from Detroit. And people will have to lay down a little bit of respect, whether they've heard you or not. But Detroit has that grit that makes the funk great. Hey, if you wanna get Music lives on. For us, this kind of music was deeply important. I just want other people to feel that, really. And so if we can play it and some other person will hear it, maybe they don't even know it's funk, but maybe they'll go look up a musician, go, go try to find um, some other music that's like this and keep the, keep the tradition alive. We love you. Good night. That's our show. To see more of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. And be sure to download the WOSU Public Media mobile app, where you can watch full episodes on your smartphone or tablet. This week, we're leaving you with the sounds of local musician and WOSU staffer Chuck Oney. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com.